God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Dun, 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 dun. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. In Bethlehem in Israel, this blessed babe was born And laid within a manger upon this blessed mom To which his mother Mary did nothing take in scorn Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy Oh, tidings of comfort and joy Fear not, then said the angel, let nothing you have cried This day is born a Savior above your virgin Joyful and dry 
say, all hail King Jesus. There you go. Don't be afraid to clap your hands. Let joy break out in this house. One body, one spirit, one voice. You ready to worship with us, church? We're going to sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. The angels sing glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born. centuries humanity has waited and tried to break the bonds of burden but sin had marred our faces our image lost our own will it cost us the very purpose for which we were created to multiply and magnify in our efforts couldn't save us but what we couldn't see the mystery God's plan set before the ages to set us free from slavery and bear the wood that built our cages. A seed of God to free our hearts and virgin's womb was born a savior. The everlasting God got off his throne to recreate us. And now he's here. So look at the son of God. 
seated on high yet laid in a manger creation and kings applaud while shepherds behold the one above angels look at the king of kings the word became flesh now born in a stable creator of all things Emmanuel prophesied God who is faithful and all of the heavens rejoice in the gospel of Jesus, El Roy, the Savior that sees us. All of the stars in the sky glorify our Redeemer, Rapha. Our God is healer, but humbly he came. In the swaddling clothes of Shalom, he's our home. The Lord is our peace. He came with the banner of victory. He is our refuge, Jehovah Nisi. And all of your names declare who you are. Almighty God who's holding the stars, but redemption came in a little child boy born to die and reconcile so all of our worship belongs to the sun and every angel begins to sing every melody to the one the lamb of god the humble king everlasting father prince of peace emmanuel god with thighs you're here Wonderful counselor, the government is resting on your shoulders. Everlasting, everlasting, singing. Everlasting Father, you're the Prince of Peace. Emmanuel, God with us, you're here with me. The wonderful King of kings, Jehovah, our light and our sacrifice, foundation and fountain, the bread of life, son of man, son of God, shepherd and savior, cornerstone, comforter, counselor, David, he is the way and the truth and the light, the rise of the sun and the end to the night, master Messiah, friend and the vine, anointed almighty, servant and son, he is our freedom and our resurrection, he is our rock and our righteousness, he is Jehovah, the land that was chosen, he is the risen one, Jesus, he is the promise, the yes and the arm, and he's the desire of nation, he's the refiner and he is a lion, perfecter of all the creation, he is our king. He is our teacher, he is our father forevermore. He is the author, he is our maker, he is our
church, every voice, sing Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father, you're the Prince of Peace. Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Wonderful, wonderful counselor, the government is resting on your shoulders. One more time, I need every voice to give Jesus the praise he's worthy of. Everlasting, everlasting Father, you are the Prince of Peace. Emmanuel. Come on, church, can we give Jesus praise today? He's worthy. Oh, he's worthy. Come on, keep it going. I can't hear you. Woo! Keep it going. Give a shout of praise. Woo! All the way in the back. I'm looking at you right there. Come on. Woo! Outside in our own. tonight come on merry christmas to you you may be seated my name is rick mcgee and i'm the executive pastor here and my name is rachel hansen i'm the next steps director you know rachel i i love good news on christmas eve what about you oh i love good news i think i should give some good news to our congregation is that okay with you i love it do you guys want some good news you have nearly eight shopping hours left until christmas <laughs> You got plenty of time, plenty of time. Maybe you're like me and you love, my favorite store on Christmas Eve is CVS because that's usually where I can get that last minute gift that I forgot. <laughs> Anybody else with me on that one? Wow, see, good news. Well, we're so glad you're here at Centerpoint. We are all about loving and leading people to a life-changing connection with Christ. And if you are new here, we would love to connect with you. Uh, after service, if you have a few minutes, you could stop by our blue tables in the Welcome Center. Our team's out there. They'd love to meet you. They'd love to answer any questions, and they'd love to give you a gift for coming today. Awesome. And everyone here should have got a card when you walk in. Can you grab those real quick, those cards that you got? You'll see that it features the order of our service today on one side, but on the back side, we have some upcoming events, and we really want to highlight that here in these next couple minutes. First of all, tomorrow, Christmas Day. Kids, are you excited for Christmas Day? Yeah, I know you are. Well, tomorrow on Christmas Day, we're going to have a church at home. We have an amazing service that we have planned for you, and you can watch it wherever you're at online. So join us tomorrow for church at home on Christmas Day. Sound good? All right. And then a week from tomorrow on New Year's Day, we're having something called one-on-one. -on -one. Say that with me. One-on-one. -on -one. That means we're having one service on the 1st at 11 a.m. right here in person. So you don't want to miss that. Come and join us on January the 1st for one service at 11 a.m. here. All right, and then on January 15th, we want to invite you back for Vision Sunday. Pastor John is gonna be sharing with us about where we're going and how we're gonna get there together as a church family. So you don't wanna miss that. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but for me, services have been awesome so far. What about you? Woo! Okay, all right. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to what's next, but I feel like maybe we're missing something. What do you think, Rick? Rachel, I was literally thinking the same thing. I do feel like we're missing something. Maybe we should ask the congregation what's missing. Is that okay? Yeah, let's ask them. All right, on the count of three, I want you to tell me what's missing so far in service. One, two, three. I totally agree. Dad jokes. I heard it. I am so no, with you. I don't, I don't think that's what I, they said. I think, I think there were some people that were asking for that. So you know what? Let's okay. just jump right into it here. Did you guys hear about the ski trip? It started out fine, but it went downhill fast. <laughs> wow. Wow. First booze of the day. Um, 
It's going to be a tough crowd. Hey, Pastor Aaron was just up here rapping. So in the, the theme of that, um, do you guys know what a snowman's favorite rapper is? Ice Cube. Right? It's good. What about this one? Did you hear about the angry snowman? He had a meltdown. <laughs> Last but not least, this one's for the kids. Any kids in the house? We got some kids out there. I heard a lot of adults screaming too. I'm with you on that one. All right, this one's for you. What did one Christmas tree say to the other Christmas tree? You need to lighten up. There you go. Okay, all See, right. It works. Um, oh, yeah, a couple of applauses yeah, out there. Thank you. I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, thanks for those dad jokes, but um, I don't think that's what they were asking, f what, they, what they said when you asked them what we were missing. You know, it's possible that I might have misunderstood. So let's ask him one more time, okay? On the count of three, tell me what you think is missing in service so far. One, two, three. Oh, a snowball fight. I definitely heard it that time, a snowball fight. Do you guys want to have a snowball fight? This is a center point tradition. So on the count of three, we're going to have a snowball fight. Help me, Rachel. Here we go. One, one two, two, three, three go! we need their help. Yeah, we're going to need your help. Okay, you guys, on the count of three, I'm going to count to three and you're going to throw all your snowboard snowballs towards oh. the platform. I'm not sure you heard Rachel, but here's what she said. On the count of three, everyone's going to try and hit Rachel. <laughs> One, two, three, <laughs> go throw them at Rachel. Right there! Right there! Keep them coming! Wow! Some of you are listening. Rachel! Wow! Okay. All right. I think there's a few more left in the risers. Keep them coming, guys. We need them all up here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for throwing them at Rachel. I appreciate that. Everybody check out this video we got for you. fight part two. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, not, I'm just kidding. Well, Merry Christmas. My name is Ann Hansen. I'm one of the pastors here. And haha, ha, too, too short. Um, I'm going to, as we get ready to give of our tithes and our offerings, I want to just share a scripture with you. It's John 3, 16 and 17. And it says this, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one <laughs> <laughs> this 
is a fourth sermon. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, back, back to this. Okay, I'm going to start over. Okay, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. So we get to celebrate the greatest gift the world has ever received, the gift of Jesus Christ. And we get to honor his life by joining him in this grace of giving. So I want to say our ministries are only possible because of your giving, your generosity. So I want to say thank you so much. Thank you for your sacrifice. I know it's difficult right now with the economy, but thank you so much for giving. And there are many ways that you can give at Center Point. Uh, if you're in person, you can give at the give boxes in the back. Or the easiest way to give is by visiting us at mycenterpoint.tv and click on, clicking on give. And I know a lot of us are already giving online, and so I want to say thank you for that. But let's just take a minute and pray over our offering and our tithes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. You are the light of the world. You are the hope of the world. You are the savior. And we love you and we honor you. And we say thank you for the gift of your life. Thank you for your perfect sacrifice. Thank you for uh, bringing us freedom, bringing us healing, hope, love, all that you bring to us. We say yes, yes to your life leading ours. Thank you, God. And we just honor you with our tithes and our giving. And we say, Lord Jesus, we put you first in every area of our lives. We put you first with our giving, with our time, our attention. And we thank you, Lord, for who you are. And we celebrate you this day and every day. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.
Merry Christmas. It's so good to see you, and I'm glad you've come, and you're here at Centerpoint Church. My name's John. I'm lead pastor here, and it's a privilege to welcome you, especially if you're new with us. I uh, really want to, it, it, actually, I'd like to encourage you to consider something. It's great to come to church on Christmas, but what would be even better would be if maybe in the new year you might consider actually starting a whole year walking with God, and we'd love to be a community where you can do that together. So this Christmas, we are uh, we're celebrating in a different kind of way. A lot of times uh, around Christmas, we, we grab hold of a theme like the light that has come in Jesus, or the hope that's available, or the joy that comes. This year, we're focusing in particular on the birth of Jesus as the humble king. And in this message, I want to share with you three blessings that are available on a personal level because of the birth of the humble king. And so I, I want to take a, a moment to just turn our attention to the scriptures. And this is familiar probably to a number of us, but you can turn there with me to Luke chapter 2, or it'll be on the screen. But this is the, the familiar or most familiar part of the Christmas story. I just want to read it. It's in Luke chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So we just sang a like, very familiar Christmas carol, born is the king of Israel. And that's what we're acknowledging has taken place on Christmas. And so we sing, born is the king, and we, we talk about the first Noel as the birth of the king, but the way that it happened it, it kind of didn't have a lot of the fanfare that you might be expecting. I and mean, when I think about a king being born, I might think about it in, in a different way than what we just read. What we just read, it happened so fast. I mean, it was literally one sentence. We just read it and we can't even remember it. It was just on the screen, but what was it again? And she gave birth to a son and she wrapped him in swaddling cloths and placed him in a manger. It's so fast. But that moment is a moment that changes everything because it is the moment that the king was born. But I want you to take notice of how the birth of the king happened. Because it, even though he's a king, he, he's not born in a, in a castle somewhere with queens and princesses and attendants. It's, it's none of that. I mean, there's no castle. There's no uh, princes and princesses. It's, it's nothing like that at all. They're not even in a hotel. I mean, they're in a, in a stable. And, and that's not what you and I might think of. We might think of a stable, a beautiful wooden uh, construction with lots of uh, stalls for the animals. No, no, it'd be like uh, at, the, at the backside of a hill with, with maybe a little cave dug out from one end of it with a, maybe a makeshift kind of a piece of roof hanging over one end, rustic, crude, really. And I think that this is important. It's not an accident. You know, the way Jesus was born is designed by God to be a reflection of part of the heart of God for, for this whole human story. And he comes, and he comes in this extremely lowly way, like totally unassuming. There's no pomp and circumstance, and there's hardly any fanfare, except for the part where the angels show up to the shepherds. But in the moment of the birth, it's... It, utter and total simplicity and complete humility. And I don't want to ask you a question. How many of you are followers of Jesus? Just raise your hand if you would say, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. Generally speaking, I'm not saying I get it right all the time, but yes. Okay, well, listen. As a follower of Jesus, I want you to take note of the way the one that you follow came into this world. Because he came into this world in total humility. I think that should mean something for us. If we actually are going to be followers of Jesus, I think we ought to pay attention to how he first showed up in this world. And maybe we need to maybe follow suit and show up in our world with something like what he came with. 
that humble disposition to say, I'm available, I'm accessible, I don't think that I'm the one who's right all the time, I'm willing to go low, I'm willing to own it. I mean, this is Jesus, right? But it's also what you and I who follow Jesus maybe need to follow him in his example of. And so this moment happens, it's Christmas, he's born, and he's born the humble king. Everyone say, the humble king. The humble king. And there might have been a lot of people in that area that would have missed this moment completely, even though he was born the king. And that's probably because different people think of different things when they think of a king. And uh, I want to just shift gears for a little bit and make sure we're all tracking together. Uh, how many first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth graders are in the room right now? Shout, hey, if you're third grade, fourth grade, or fifth grade. Ready to say it. Yes. Okay. I thought so. So I always want to make sure that this is a, a good experience for all of us. So let's play a little game. We're going to play a little game. I need everybody's help. And the uh, game is simple. It's called Name That King. Name That King. It's kind of like this. It goes like this. Uh, if, uh, you're going to answer back, right? So I'll say it like this. If you're thinking of the person who lives in a castle and he owns it and he's in charge of it, you're thinking of the King. Yeah, that was not a trick question. That's for real. So we'll, we'll keep going. Okay, we'll keep going. So if you're thinking of uh, this particular person called Simba, you're thinking of the Lion King. That's right. If you're thinking of a giant gorilla climbing on the Empire State Building, you're thinking of King Kong. That's right. If you are thinking of a big juicy whopper, you're thinking of Burger King. That's right. If you're thinking of a terrible, scary novel like Misery or Pet Cemetery, you think, how Christmassy was that? Okay. If you're thinking of uh, an amazing uh, hockey team from Los Angeles, you're thinking of the Kings. That's right. If you're thinking of basketball and the greatest player maybe right now, it'll, uh, you're thinking of the King, King James, right? Especially now that he's our Lakers, right? We can give him some brave props. And uh, if you're a boomer generation, you think of tennis, you're thinking of Billie Jean King. All right. If you're a, if you're a blues aficionado, you're thinking of B.B. King. All right. And hopefully by now you can answer this right. If you're thinking of Christmas and Jesus, you're thinking of the humble king. Say it again. The humble king. The humble king. This is what we're, we're celebrating is the birth of the one who, who ultimately was called king of the Jews. It's an important part of the, the story. He's born king of the Jews. And there's, there's an element to that that we need to understand so that we can capture the heart of what's spoken by the angel Gabriel. In the chapter that precedes this, the angel Gabriel shows up to Mary before the birth and maybe before the pregnancy even happens and gives this, uh, this word, and, and we'll turn there. It's in Luke chapter 1, verse 28. It says that the angel Gabriel came to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. So Mary has this encounter, and God is moving. Something powerful and supernatural is about to unfold, and this angel shows up, and Mary's response is to be what? Do you remember what it said that she was? Troubled. She was greatly troubled. <laughs> and I want to mention this because here's what I know. It's true that sometimes when God is moving, sometimes when something profound and spiritually powerful, supernatural is unfolding, it can sometimes have that effect. It can cause us to feel maybe a little uncomfortable, maybe even like Mary, a bit disturbed. And I think that's important for me to say right now because I'm guessing that there are some of us who came to church on a, on a Christmas Eve service, not because it's our favorite place to be, but because you know someone invited us or said we had to be here. And maybe we feel not necessarily full tilt, greatly disturbed like Mary, but maybe some degree of uncomfortable. And I just want to say, if that's where you, you feel yourself being, you're in good company. <laughs> Mary, right there in the middle of the Christmas story, that's exactly how she felt. It, it was 
God who was moving. And I think maybe you and I, as human beings who are, who are comfortable in our humanity, we should begin to accept that sometimes when God is actually moving, that it can feel jarring. It can push us out of our element a little bit. It can cause us sometimes to even feel a little bit uncomfortable, maybe. But that's to be expected. Because we're talking about God. We're talking about the power of God being present, showing up. And, and I, I know this. I know that if you want to, you can stick with your uh, all boxed up, perfect religious formula. But I think there's something probably inside of each one of us that craves something far beyond that. And that it's the power of God that we actually need. And when the power of God begins to move, it can be a little uncomfortable. And I'm glad that that's the case. But we're, we're coming together to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And the greeting of the angel in verse 28 was this. I want you to read this with me out loud. Ready, say it, go. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. I want you to just keep that on the screen for a moment. And I want you to just say that phrase again. The Lord is with you. Okay, I want you to turn to somebody next to you right now and look at them and say, the Lord is with you. Right to them. Just do it. Okay, now, it sounded like a low uh, murmur right now. So I want you to try this again. This time, turn to someone else, the person that was your second choice. And uh, I want you to turn to them right now and just say to them, the Lord is with you. And say it louder, like you mean it, okay? Yeah. <laughs> The Lord is with you. I know for some of us, maybe this just felt awkward, but for others of us, I'm wondering if maybe it, there's something about that that's kind of profound, to have somebody look at you and say to you, the Lord is with you. There's something deeply moving about that, if you can really take it in, that, that we could look at one another and, and acknowledge that there is one worthy of the title Lord, the one who created the heavens and the earth. God, who is the Father from the everlasting, and that, that you're not alone, that the Lord is with you. And I, I want to say, on one hand, maybe this is just the greeting of the angel, kind of like saying, hey. But on the other hand, this moment where the angel says, the Lord is with you, it actually is a portent pointing to the, the heart of what Christmas is actually all about, that you are not alone, that God is with you. The Lord is with you, and you can make this declaration with me. I'm not alone. The Lord is with me. The Lord is with me. I'm not alone. The Lord is with me. I want you to say it with me one time. Say it. I'm not alone. The Lord is with me. This is at the heart of what Christmas is all about. There are, there are some of us that may have conceived of God as a kind of a deity that's out there somewhere beyond the edge of the universe, uh, kind of maybe watching a little bit, but you know, started the thing and you know, set it in motion and walked away. And it's, it's probably pretty comfortable to think of God that way. But there's something deeply comforting to know that he is the Lord who is with you. And in fact, when, when the, other, the other passages that speak about Jesus coming on the scene, they say, give him the name Emmanuel, because it's who he is, God with us. And this is one of the blessings of Christmas, to be able to hold in your heart at any given moment, I'm not alone, the Lord is with me. Say it again, I'm not alone, the Lord is with me. And what that means is that as I find myself facing difficulties and challenges, I don't have to do it alone because my heavenly father is standing right by my side as I deal with what's coming my way. I'm not alone. The Lord is with me. And even when I find myself at the end of my rope, I have one who's willing to pick me up. And that's the Lord who is with me. I'm not alone. The Lord is with me. So the angel speaks to Mary and says, you're going to have a baby. So far, so good. But then the angel keeps talking and says, you're going to have a son. You're going to call him Jesus, which, by the way, means he, he will save his people. You're going to call him Jesus, and he will be the son of the most high God. That is to say, he will be God. Wow. And he's going to rule on the throne of his father, David. And if you're a good Jewish girl, you recognize th this is an immense promise that's being fulfilled and he will rule on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom will have no end. 
This is a crazy, huge moment that's happening. And I wonder if maybe, maybe Mary struggled to take it all in. And, and she, she's got to take it in. She's got to take it to heart. But can you imagine the conversations that unfolded after this? Right? I was talking to her friends, and, and, and uh, I'm pregnant. Okay, well, what are you having? Well, I'm, I'm, having, I'm having a king. <laughs> okay, well, not, not exactly. Actually, I'm, I'm having God. I mean, it's a crazy conversation, right? But this happened, and, and it might have been difficult for even people around Mary to accept what she was reporting to them, but, but it happened this way. I'll, I'll give an analogy. It's kind of like this. There was a uh, a headline in the news a couple of weeks ago that I, I took a screenshot of. I just, it was just kind of crazy to me. It was this guy, Andy Hackett, an Englishman uh, from Kidderminster, England, who was on a fishing trip, and he was fishing with a buddy, and he got something on his line, and he started reeling on it, and it was a 25-minute uh, battle with whatever was on the end of this line. And after 25 minutes of fighting with this thing, uh, his, his buddy saw what was about to come up out of, of the water, and he said, "I right, might, you're going to need a bigger bow, because he's English, right? So he said, you're going to need a bigger bow, right? And I mean, that's not exactly what you'd expect to be hearing when somebody's on a fishing trip, right? But then the very next thing is Andy Hackett pulls this guy right out of the lake. That, that, I mean, yeah, you're going you're gonna to need a bigger bow, right? Now you understand. But the, I mean, it was a 67 pound goldfish, the world's biggest goldfish ever caught. I mean, ridiculous, crazy, right? And, and could you imagine if Andy Hackett, at the end of his fishing trip, walked into a, into a local pub and talked about, hey guys, I went fishing today. I caught me a 67 pound goldfish. They wouldn't believe him, except that there were reporters that took pictures. There was a record of this thing. And I wonder if maybe for, for some, hearing about God coming into this world in, in this baby, Jesus, if, if maybe it'd be difficult for some to believe, but there was a record. And I want you to know that there's a record. The New Testament is regarded even by secular historians as a, as a trustworthy historical document. And the New Testament records, especially in the Gospel of Luke, as a historical document, the events that we call Christmas in detail, almost painstaking, embarrassing detail. And then we have the Old Testament historical record where the events that we call Christmas were promised and prophesied for hundreds and then thousands of years. And this took place to fulfill those promises. And the king was born in this moment. The king was born. And this baby was born. And then there's like two moments from the childhood of Jesus that we hear about. And then we fast forward to about 30 years later. And then King Jesus comes on the scene in his ministry. And the first words of Jesus recorded in his ministry on this planet are the words recorded in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. And the words there are simply this. Jesus comes on the scene and says, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. I want you to just say these words out loud with me. Ready, go. Say it. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. I want you to say it one more time, louder than you just did. Track with me, go. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus, I think, is still saying these words. And, and I think it's actually very particular for somebody. It's like God, even in this moment, is saying, the time has come for you to wake up. You spent enough time over there in that garbage. The time has come for you to walk away from it. The time has come. The time has come for you to recognize that where you've been isn't doing you any good and it's time for you to come into my light, my love, my peace, my goodness, my kingdom. It's like God is even right now speaking to somebody saying, the time has come for you to receive the gift of my mercy once and for all and to stop doubting whether you deserve it. God is speaking right now to somebody, and the words are the same. These words of Jesus, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Everybody say repent. repent. 
Okay, now I want you to smile. Everybody smile real quick, just a little Christmas smile. And now say repent while smiling. <laughs> You're almost like, wait a minute, are we, can we do that? Because we have this idea that repent is uh, this awful thing. But the truth is that to be able to repent is a gift. To, to actually repent, this is what it is about. To repent, it literally means to, to do an about face in your life. To change the direction of your life by the power of God to change the direction of your life for the better. But it starts with a change of mind. And even the word repent in the core of it is about your mental state shifting, having a shift in your mindset, shifting your mindset from where you were trapped and thinking this was the only thing that you could ever do and you were bound to keep on repeating it. The mindset that says, I'm stuck and I'm not worthy. The, the mindset that says, I don't even know if I could ever be loved by anyone, let alone God. All of those mindsets that don't do us any good, there's an invitation from Jesus to change that mindset and to turn and to turn and repent and believe the good news. And it's good news. Jesus, when he comes on the scene, humble king Jesus, first and foremost, everywhere he went was talking about his kingdom. And when he talks about his kingdom, he says it's a good news kingdom. It's a good news kingdom. Can I tell you about the good news for a second? I'm going to tell you about the good news for a second. <laughs> the good news, it's this. The good news is that people who are mess-ups can be made new. The good news is that the sick can be made well, that the broken can be mended, that outcasts can be included, that lonely can be belong, that the fatherless can be adopted, that the fearful can be given courage, and that the empty can be filled, that the weak can be made strong, that the guilty can be given grace that the weak can be turned into spiritual warriors, that the hell bound can go to heaven, that the blind can see, that the afflicted and the addicted can be set free, and that the hurting can get healing, and that sinners can be saved, and that we can all be forgiven. That's good news. That's good news. Yeah, that's good news. Thank you, God, for good news. It's good news. And the good news, the sum total of the good news is that I'm not condemned. God is for me. And so this is the second blessing. The first one was, I'm not alone. God is with me. And the second blessing I want to share with you this Christmas is I'm not condemned. God is for me. Would you say this with me? I'm not condemned. God is for me. Say it one more time. I'm not condemned. God is for me. Put your hand on your heart. Say it one last time. Say it. I'm not condemned. God is for me. He's demonstrated by coming into this earthly time and space continuum in the flesh, humble King Jesus as a sign of his unfailing love for you. God is for me. We all get to live in this reality. Ephesians 1.4 puts it like this. It says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Would you read this verse out loud with me? Say it, go. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. This is the extent of God's love, is that before he even made this world, he had his love trained in on you. In fact, that... The world that he made, he made out of his love for you and with his love set on you from the very beginning. I'll, I'll illustrate it like this. Imagine that for Christmas this year, you were to get a 3D printer. And maybe there might be one or two of us uh, engineering types that might have even asked for that. But imagine you got a 3D printer and, and you hook it up to your computer. You probably wouldn't hook that thing up and just print a meaningless blob, right? If you got a 3D printer, 
What you would make would be something that you would make with a thoughtfulness. You would, you would make something that you've designed. You would have a, a, a purpose in mind for it. Like, for example, you might make a little bowl and think to yourself, I'm making this little bowl, and we're going to set it on the table by the door, and we're going to put our keys in it. Or you might make a, 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 a little uh, thing that turns into a, a, a holder for a magnet, and you're going to give it as a gift to your mom, and she's going to put it on her refrigerator. I don't know. I'm getting a little creative here, but if you, if you had something like that, you would use it and you would use it with an intentionality. You would make what you're making with a purpose in mind. And I want to tell you this, that God made you with a purpose in mind. And the purpose God had in mind for you was first and foremost, that you would be a recipient of his love. I'm telling you, you were made to receive the love of God. You were made and designed by God to be an instrument that would receive and be saturated and fulfilled by his perfect love and that that love of God would then flow through you into this world. That's what you're made for. That's what the scriptures reveal. And and so why? Why did God need to come in the form of a human being? The reason God wanted to come in human form, which we celebrate at Christmas, is because of his love. This past week, um, my wife and I had a, a surprise that was planned for us by somebody else. We didn't really understand what was going on and got some text messages. And, and all of a sudden, before we knew it, there was a knock at the door. And then the door opens up. And then this, this couple walks in with a stroller. And at first, my jaw dropped. I was like, I didn't understand. what I didn't even almost put the pieces together. And then I realized who was standing in front of me. And it was like this, this wonderful old friend and, and a couple that I had actually married a number of years ago, and they showed up, and they planned a surprise visit, got Ann and I together, and our hearts melted, and we saw them with their brand new baby, and it was like such a cool thing to have happen, such an awesome surprise. And, and you know what? They didn't have to do that. They could have just sent a card. They could have just texted a little text message, hey, we love you guys, just want you to know. <laughs> you know? But they went out of their way to say, you know what, if we can... If we can actually walk through the door and show up, arms wide open, and and hug these guys, then that's what we're going to do because we love them. And I want to tell you that your heavenly father, in coming humble King Jesus into this world, it was because of his love for you, that he didn't want to just send a text message about it. He wanted to walk through the door, so to speak, right into this place called earth with his arms wide open, ready to embrace you with his mercy and his unfailing love. He did it because of his love. So why did God want to and need to become human, first and foremost, because he wanted to demonstrate and share his love with you. And he he does. He, He loves us. God loves us so much that this world that he created is perfectly designed to nurture us as human beings. I mean, when you really think about it, everything about the the planet is perfectly designed by God to give us the ecosystem we need to thrive within, right down to the cycles of the sun each year, giving way to months and weeks and days perfectly aligned to activate the circadian rhythms inside of us that cause us to thrive. I mean, God really loves us so much, even into what he created for us. And because of God's goodness and love, he created a world in which There's real freedom. And the freedom is what gives way to beauty, is what allows for actual creativity, is what makes love possible. And that that freedom is also what gave way ultimately to what we would call fallenness. And fallenness is is a reality of the human experience that I don't probably have to tell you a whole lot about. You've experienced it. The fallenness of the human experience touches every one of us. I mean, I'm talking about the wars and strife and chaos out there in the world. But not just out there in the world. I'm talking about the chaos, the strife, the the rage, the hatred, the unforgiveness, the bitterness, the damage, the disappointment, the grieving, the mourning, the loss, the death, all of those things 
things that, that come into our lives with such devastating force that they could practically undo us. And because of that, God wanted to come with a defeating force almost up from the ground in the birth of the humble king, coming almost, as it were, by surprise to overtake the darkness that was trying to deal us a death blow and take it out. And he, and he did it. This is what God has done in Christmas. I need to tell you more about this. Why did God need to come into the world as a human being? Why couldn't God just remain the distant clockmaker deity far away somewhere? Because first of all, that's not who he is. And second of all, because that would never actually do what our hearts needed doing. And the darkness I just described had to be dealt with because it was ultimately the power of the devil that caused the pain of the fallenness that we suffer under. And in order to deal with the power of the devil, God needed to show up in the human story as a human to bring the victory that humans need. I know some of us are right now going, what just happened? I thought it was Christmas. What's all this stuff about the devil? <laughs> I'm telling you, you need, you, need to, you need to allow your mind to perceive beneath the surface level sentimentality of a holiday. And you need to understand the spiritual depth of what's actually taking place in what we call Christmas. And what's happening in Christmas is God, out of his unfailing love for you, is coming after the devil and taking him out on your behalf. And it's a sneak attack. That's why he's the humble king, unassuming, unpretentious. Almost you could miss it. But God was doing exactly what needed to be done. Let, let me take you to Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 2. And, and some of you who are wondering if this is ever going to end, it's going to be three or four more minutes. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and following. It said about us, since the children, that's you and me, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. <laughs> this is part of Christmas. Did you catch it? That God wanted for you and I to be free from the power of the devil. So he came in in human form, in the human story, to take out the devil who was trying to get a chokehold on us. I'm so grateful for Christmas and what it means in terms of God's love manifesting, showing up, breaking the power of the devil from off of any of our lives who would ever choose to turn to him. It's such good news that you and me get to live free from the power of the devil to whatever degree we would be willing to turn to him and say, help me. And in this instant, because he came and because he did deal a death blow to the devil, we get to live free. Somebody right now should say amen, because it's good news. It's good news. It's good news, and I pray that you would catch hold of it and that you would take hold of what, what Jesus was accomplishing. What Jesus was doing in, in coming into this world was achieving something for you that he dreamt of, which was you being free from the power of the devil and all of his tricks and living in victory, a victory called abundant life. This is what we read in the words of Jesus in John 10.10, 10, and it's every bit as much Christmas as Luke 2. It says in John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The abundant life is what Jesus came for. And, and one of the blessings of Christmas, the third blessing of Christmas, is that Jesus has abundant eternal life for me. Abundant eternal life. What is abundant life? Abundant life is a life marked by the hope that God brings even into the middle of circumstances that would leave anyone else despairing. But because you know the love of God, something rises up in you and says, even though there's fog, I got some fog lights and I'm gonna make it through this thing. The abundant life is a life marked by you and I facing difficulties and challenges because those are real, but finding a strength rising up inside of us to charge that hill with perseverance and endurance because that energy is coming from the throne room of God. 
The abundant life is a life marked by the power and love of God flowing through you and me so that everywhere we walk, we bring a touch of heaven to those that we come into contact with so much as we walk in step with the Holy Spirit. The abundant life is a life marked by waking up every single day knowing this is another day in which I am forgiven and that I'm living in the grace of God and that I am anticipating the power of God coming through in my day. The abundant life is a life marked by living here and now with the hope of heaven forever. It's a good life, the abundant life, and it's an eternal life. John 20, verse 31 says this. It says, these things in the Bible are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. I need to read that again, because we've read a lot of Bible verses today, and I want you to know why why they were written, and why you are hearing them. Again, it says these things in the scriptures, these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, by, would you say it with me? By believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. There is life available for you. And the life with God, that supernatural, vital, spiritual life, it isn't the product of you pressuring up your religiosity and trying to prove how good you've been lately. The vital, spiritual, supernatural life that's available to you is through believing in this humble king, Jesus, who he is, what he's done and opening your heart to him, yielding your life to him, letting his hope fill you up, letting his love heal you where you're broken, letting his mercy cover over all your sin, letting his promise of salvation be the great reward that you walk toward every day of your life. This is what you and me are made for, man. For me, I'm pretty excited about it. I'm excited that I get to live every single day of my life knowing, knowing the reason for the hope that I have and that it's not about me. It's not about what I've done or haven't done. It's about Jesus. It's about the humble king and everything he's done. I want you to know, man, there's so much relief in this. Somebody, you've thought to yourself that that being, quote, religious is about you trying to clean up your act and prove something to God or to God's people that somehow you deserve what God has. Nothing could be further from the actual truth. The actual truth is that a real life with God is about you saying, here I am, God, flaws and all, everything that I've got, the good, bad, and the ugly, here I am, and God saying, finally. And you're welcome in my arms, and my mercy is a free gift to you, and it's available. And for somebody, the, re- the reason you're here is because Jesus is still saying, The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's like the door is just appearing right before you. The door into everything good from God. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent, like change your mind. You've thought to yourself, I'm not ever going to be one of those religious freaks. I'm not going to be a religious freak either, but I am going to be a a person who receives the free gift of the mercy of Jesus Christ and feels the relief that comes knowing it's not up to me anymore. It's all about what Jesus has done. I want that for somebody. For somebody, the reason you're here is because the time has come and, and Jesus is saying it to you. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. You need his gift of mercy. You really do. You need his gift of mercy. More more than maybe you even know right now. But the good news is that you can receive his gift of mercy in an instant. And he knows you need it. The only thing that remains is for you to, to, to bow down before him finally, figuratively speaking, and say, yes. Yes, Jesus, to who you are. Yes, Jesus, to the gift you offer. Yes, Jesus to the reality of eternal life, abundant eternal life. In just a few moments, we're gonna sing a song that's familiar. But before we sing it the way we're used to hearing it, 
I want you to hear just the chorus of it with some different words. And while you hear this, pray. He knows our need to our Lord Jesus, for many of us who are uh, believers, we do, we, we, we bend, we bend the knee figuratively in the posture of our hearts and minds before you, and we say, you are our king. And I pray, Lord, right now for some of my brothers and sisters who are gathered in this moment, I pray for a release of hope. And I came into this experience with a prophetic word just at this particular gathering, a prophetic word to say, that the Lord is releasing. And it's simply this, the Lord saying, do not hold back. I've got you and you're gonna make it. Get up, keep taking each next step. I've got your back. I'm not gonna let you drop. I'm not gonna let you fall. I've got you. Keep getting up, keep taking each next step. I am with you. Don't hold back. Be courageous. The dream that I've stirred up inside of you, shut down the lie of the enemy that causes you to believe that you don't deserve that. You do. Rise up, walk towards it. I've got you, you're gonna make it. Ah, this afternoon, just for this gathering, I have felt that prophetic word in my spirit. I release it to you. And for somebody, you need to know that is exactly what you needed to hear from the Lord. And it was prompted by the Spirit of God that you would hear it right here and right now. And maybe if that's you, you could just take a deep breath and just simply in the quietness of your own heart say, thank you, God, for speaking that word to me. But Lord, I also pray in this moment that you would do some spiritual awakening for others of us. God, I pray that even right now, you would allow some of us to wake up to the fact that, that we need you. And God, I pray that you would allow us to know your mercy and your grace. So while we're praying together, there are some of you who, this is all totally new for you. And I want you to hear this clearly. This is available. This mercy and grace from God, it's available to you. You don't have to wait. God's not looking for you to have earned it or proved something. You might even still have a lot of questions and a lot of things to still wonder and figure out. That's fine. But you can start right here, right now. Start a life with Jesus. Receive his gift. We, we call salvation a gift from God because that's what it is. It's a gift. And gifts are something that have to be received. Can you imagine if all of those presents under the tree just stayed there, wrapped up? No, no, no. A gift is something that somebody's got to pick up and say, I receive it and open it. And, and this gift of salvation, for someone, it's your time. The time has come. It's your time to, to receive the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. There's nothing you have to do to deserve it. It's a gift. But what is needed is your moment of receiving it. So Father, I pray that you would allow some of us right now to have the courage to receive the gift of salvation in Jesus. While we're praying together, if you need to once and for all, like finally say, Jesus, yes. I still have questions and I don't know if I get it all, but I get this, that I need you. I need your mercy, I need your grace. I want to receive your gift of salvation. If you're ready, you wanna say yes to Jesus and ask him to forgive your sin and save your life, then on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand as a way of saying, I wanna give my life to Jesus. Or maybe for somebody, you need to recommit your life to him because you've been on the edge 
and he's calling you back. One, I understand that I'm a human being who is made to experience and receive the love of my heavenly father. And two, I understand that Jesus, the son of God, is offering me the gift of salvation and the forgiveness of my sins. And if you're ready to say yes to him, on the count of three, you raise your hand. Three. I believe in Jesus, and I ask for the forgiveness of my sins in Jesus. I want you to raise your hand if that's you. If you're saying, I want to say yes to Jesus. Everyone's praying, but this is your moment to once and for all consider whether you are right with God. And keep your hand up for a moment. Thank you, right here in the middle. And over here in the middle, thank you. It's excellent. And my right over towards the back, thank you. In the middle over in the left, thank you. And over here in, in the left, it's awesome. Yes, excellent. You've had your hand raised and take it a step further. I want you to join me and raise your voice in a moment of faith. And you might even just say something like that. You could say this with me. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. Say it with me. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. Say it one more time with me. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. I repent and turn from my sin, and I turn to you, Jesus. And just ask him, would you forgive my sin? Say it to him. Jesus, would you forgive my sin? Would you save my life? I receive your gift of salvation right now. Jesus Christ, I declare you are my Lord and my Savior from this moment on. Thank you for the gift of new life. I receive it now by faith. In Jesus' name. And we all say amen. Amen. Let's honor him. Let's give him praise and thank him for the beauty of Christmas and what happened on the original Christmas Eve that was holy and beautiful.
good. Did you guys enjoy service tonight? Wow, well, your experience does not stop here. Because it was 80 degrees today, we have a hot cocoa bar outside. I know you guys are chilly. We gotta brave this weather, folks. Hey, get some photo ops, do the horse-drawn carriage, but from all of us at Centerpoint, have a Merry Christmas. Thanks for coming.